Is it okay to neglect my children to go mountain biking? Why do you look like Mark McGrath from Sugar Ray? Air or coil? Did Jeff ever work at McDonald's? Thank you for turning into another version of Ask Jeff Anything. But before we start, I wanted to show you a clip from one of my favorite movies and first person to guess which movie it is down in the comments wins something. Hey, this isn't over yet. We're not giving up on Darren. Yeah. Coming on, yeah. All right, so there is a bunch of questions here, some about bikes, some about myself, some that are completely random and pretty damn funny. So let's dive right into it. Joshua Shively, Shively, does the steep C-tube angle on the new Yeti bikes have a big impact on climbing efficiency? Are there pros and cons to a steep C-tube? Uh, it does impact climbing efficiency, and that's why a whole ton of brands are moving to that. So steepening that C-tube angle makes a big difference when you're in the saddle climbing. It puts you in a better body position to transfer more power to the pedals. Uh, that is even more relevant the taller you are, right? Because your C-tube angle comes off of your bottom bracket, and the taller you are, the further away basically your butt is from that bottom bracket. So tall guys have been complaining about C-tube angles for a long time, and now bikes are all starting to go that way. I don't think there's really any cons to it, not that I can see. Um, you could definitely tell when you hop on a more old school geo bike that has a slacker C-tube angle versus the new steeper ones. Uh, again, in the seat, climbing, definitely makes a big difference in a very positive way. What is better, to buy pre-built or build my own bike? I'm asking for a trail slash enduro bike that costs around 2,500. So if you're in a $2,500 price point, I would suggest either getting something used and try and find something in good condition, maybe pink bike buy sell them for them, um, or just go with a hardtail, because 2,500 bucks, that's kind of at the price point where if you get a $2,500 full suspension bike, it's probably gonna have pretty bad parts on it and it's not gonna be that great, so it's probably better. If I had $2,500, I would buy a nicer hardtail with a good drivetrain, good brakes, and a good fork, and I'd ride the hell out of it until I could save up some money and then go full suspension there. So yeah, in terms of buying it pre-built or build your own, it's always more value for your dollar when you buy a complete bike. Uh, there's kind of a lot of reasons behind this, but a lot of the reason is bike manufacturers, the frame brands, they're getting all of the components for a really cheap price, and they're more or less selling them to you at cost. And the easy way you can tell this is like, look at the cost of a frame versus the cost of that exact same frame built up. Um, and then if you go and take those same parts and add them up on different you know, places around online, it would be way more expensive to sort of piece it all together on your own. So if you're really looking for the most value for your money, always buy a complete bike. If you're looking for something more custom and very particular on what you want, then yeah, of course go custom and, and do that. But that's definitely at a different price point than 2,500. Are you the tequila type or whiskey type? Um, I actually like both, but I really like whiskey these days. So I'm gonna go whiskey. Oh my. <laughs> Don't you get sick. What inspired you to open a shop? Uh, kind of a number of things. I think, you know, when I opened a Worldwide was in 2011, and I saw a lot of the industry evolving to be um, more just multi-channel retail. People loved the sort of brick and mortar, you know, physical retail aspect, but online shopping was also growing a ton. And I really felt that I could sort of make some noise there and, and do some good and, and provide a good experience. And I didn't really see anyone doing what I thought could be done well in terms of a really good customer experience, better technology, um, having like a focus on customer support. I think a lot of the big online players back then were really behind the times when it came to answering emails on time or answering the phone or having a clue what the hell they were talking about when people asked them questions about the products they sold. You said you're uh, looking for bottom bracket that's like one of those uh spinny bearing things attaching the fork to the bike right yeah uh... all that sort of stuff so i just saw like an opportunity to build something really cool that could be fun and it could be in a passion i love and all my mountain bike buddies could join me and we could have a good time doing it and a lot of the reason was just for fun What is the next big MTB technology that everyone must have? Uh, that's a tough question. Honestly, I don't 
think anything. I think we're at a point now um, where bikes are super optimized and there's not much left to do. They just work amazing. There's little iterations that are happening, um, but they're pretty expensive and they're kind of like not a huge amount better. For example, uh, SRAM access, electronic shifting, absolutely phenomenal, super amazing technology. Is it a must have? No. like. The old stuff still works great. When you compare like an existing 12 speed Eagle drivetrain versus the Axis, um, yeah, Axis is better, costs a bit more. It's not like big, super relevant. You don't have to have it per se. Uh, let's see, oh, Trust Message Fork, that thing kicks ass. That's the best fork I've ridden for a trail bike, but it's also a lot more expensive than a normal fork and it looks kind of funky and it's a little heavy and maybe isn't totally there. I don't know, it's a tough question. I don't think anything right now. I think everything's pretty incredibly optimized and bikes have come a long way and a lot of them are just really damn good. Can I apply to work there? Yes, absolutely. We are actually uh, hiring right now in our new location in Reno, Nevada. Uh, check this link right here. Drop your contact information and resume in there and we'd love to talk to you. We're always looking for cool people to join the team. Why do you look like Mark McGrath from Sugar Ray? What was your old job before founding Worldwide Cyclery? Um, I actually worked at a local bike shop called Michael's Bicycles, not to be confused with the big Northern California bike shop chain, Mike's Bikes, but Michael's Bicycles, single location, family owned. It's in Newbury Park, California. Uh, I worked there for quite a while as a teenager and until I was 19 or 20. Um, I love the place. The owners were amazing. The whole family that ran it was awesome. Uh, they did, they still do zero online sales. That's not their thing. They run a great local retail business in Newbury Park and great people. And yeah, that's what I did. I learned a lot about the bike industry there. And uh, yeah, it was a ton of great experience. Uh, other than that, I also sort of on the side sold a bunch of faucets and shit on the internet. Some of them turned out to be stolen. Uh, yeah, that's a long story, but I talked about it on a podcast once, so check the link below in the video description if you wanna to listen to that podcast and hear that pretty funny story. If you had to choose between a YT Capra or Jeffsy, which would you choose? I would choose the YT Jeffsy 2.9. Uh, I like trail bikes, I like 29ers, I like that travel range. Um, yeah, I like YTs, I think they're sweet. And I think that Christopher Walken's video that YT did was like one of the greatest like content pieces in the mountain bike industry ever. I've watched it a million times, it's badass, check that out. Don't fight it, go with it. Ride it out, together, just like Jeff C and I. Are you subscribed to PewDiePie? Pew, PewDiePie? Is that even spelled right? Oh my god, dude. Is it okay to neglect my children to go mountain biking? <laughs> I don't know, they're not my kids, go ahead. Jeff, yes or no? Always yes, I'm a yes guy. Yes! When will you show us your new bike, Jeff? Heard on a recent video you sold your Yeti or something. I do have a new bike coming, and there's gonna be multiple YouTube videos about it, and it's gonna be freaking amazing! What is your personal favorite tire setup? I'm thinking about switching to Maxxis Asagai up front and Maxxis Dissector in the rear. That is a phenomenal tire setup. Um, my personal favorite, I guess I'll give it to you for my trail bike, which I ride most often. I usually run a 29 by 2.4 um, Max's Minion DHR2 in the front, and then I run a 2.4 Recon in the back. Um, I'm going to try out the dissector up front, um, paired with that recon in the back, because I think that'll be a pretty interesting setup. Um, definitely tr excited to try that out, because the dissector comes in interesting weight ranges when you compare it to the DHR2 versus the DHF. The dissector in the same size of a DHR2 is actually lighter, and I'm kind of a weight weenie, so I'm interested in trying it out. How important do you think the EWS is slash was for the development of mountain biking? I think it was probably pretty important. Um, I think the most people are doing enduro type riding and a lot that's a lot more accessible for people to race events and enduro type events as opposed to just, because kind of prior to that you had just cross country and just downhill and then you had four cross and slalom but those are pretty small. So it was just downhill and just cross country. 
Then they kind of were dabbling with Super D, which I raced a bunch as a kid. And that's kind of what then eventually evolved into enduro racing and that evolved into the EWS. Um, so I think it's great. I think it's made a huge difference and it's been amazing to see how much just enduro type of riding and racing has grown. And I love it. Anything that helps the sport grow and get more people out there having fun on mountain bikes is good in my book. Can you put a 150 mil fork on a Revel Rascal? Um, absolutely, it's 130 in the back, comes in stock with a 140. Uh, I always say it's fine to put a fork that has 10 millimeters more or less travel than what your bike was originally spec'd for. And in that case, it's 10 millimeters more. So if you go 10 millimeters more travel on your fork, it's gonna lift the front end up a bit, lift the bottom bracket a little bit, um, make it a little bit slacker. But 10 millimeters is like pretty negligible difference. You're not gonna notice it a ton, maybe a little bit if you're real sensitive to it. That's what she said. Um, yeah, you can absolutely do that and it's not a bad idea. How would someone get into the bike industry? Uh, I would first start to think about all the different jobs in the bike industry. You could work at a bike shop, you could work at a component brand, a bike brand, a media outlet. There's a lot of different areas you could go. So maybe what do you like? Do you like working on things? Do you like filming videos? Do you like writing content? Do you like selling things? Uh, so I'd think about that. Uh, Bicycle Retailer Brain, Bicycle Retail and Industry News is a website that has a bunch of job postings for different bicycle available jobs around the country. Um, so those outdoor jobs, they have a lot of those too. And then all those big brands like Trek, Specialized, Giant, those guys are hiring constantly. Uh, so yeah, that's how you do it. And just send your resume out and see if you find anything you like. Don't expect to get paid very much. Do you think people ride bikes that have too much travel for the given terrain? <laughs> Yeah, all the time, uh, totally. Next question. Do you ride? <laughs> it's so true. It is, I did it too yesterday. Yeah, I know. It's totally. great, who cares? Yeah, I know, who cares? Do you ride flats or clips? Does this change based on the bike you ride? Uh, it totally changes, I ride both. Mountain biking, I always ride clips. I ride Crank Brothers. 99% um, of the time, the Mallet Ease with the regular spindle, not the long spindle. Um, I've tried a bunch of different clipless pedals. I absolutely love Crank Brothers. They're my favorite. Um, they've got a lot of different cleat options. We one time made a video about how to set up Crank Brothers cleats in ridiculous detail. If you're curious about that, check it out. Uh, we also did a video all about flats versus clipless where I kind of talked about ride whatever's more comfortable for you because being comfortable on your bike is really gonna make you ride the best and that's more important than anything. Um, so yeah, mountain biking, I'm always riding clips. Uh, dirt jump bike, gravel bike, commuter bike, BMX bike, I'm always on flats because those things don't make that much sense to clip in. Uh, there you go. I'm stressed about my motivations to mountain biking, my career, and my school education slash sports. What are your best tips for someone in my situation? Uh, I don't know, I'm not a life coach, but I would say ride your mountain bike when you have free time because it's a lot of fun and you should probably give some thought to your career and your education, but um, I don't know, just like have a great life, make time for all of it, you know? Do what's important to you and do what's fun. You like tacos? If so, what's your favorite taco place? Of course I like tacos, tacos are delicious. Uh, favorite taco place, I just looked it up. It's called the Turf and Surf Po' Boy in downtown Austin, Texas. I had a Mahi Mahi taco there uh, with Michael. You know Michael. How did you enjoy it, the park? Oh, so good. And it was the best freaking taco I've ever had. You gotta go there. So I recently crash, crash? I can't speak. So I recently crashed on a big drop because my front tire blew up. Face palm. But I wanted to ask, how would you overcome the fear in the situation so you don't say anything like, what if, what if this, what if that? I'm asking for the time when I'm not injured anymore. Uh, that's a pretty heavy question. A lot of people crash and hurt themselves pretty bad on bikes, and especially if it's in a certain way. <laughs> You're definitely probably gonna have some fears. Uh, I, I blew up this entire shoulder at National Champs downhill racing in 2007. Yeah, and I like broke the uh, collarbone in seven places, broke the scapula, ripped all these ligaments. This whole shoulder was like gone, it was like multiple surgeries, six months of physical therapy. Um, getting back on the bike, was I afraid to go over the bars? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I think it's something that you're kind of worried and nervous about it while you're going through that healing process, but once you get back on your bike, 
you're not just gonna go out there and ride full pace again. You're gonna slowly get back into the scheme of things. You're gonna realize that you can crash all the time and not get hurt. And people who ride mountain bikes crash a lot and it's like one out of every two dozen crashes you're gonna maybe get hurt. Um, and having your front tire blow up on a drop is like extremely rare. So the odds of that ever happening again, yeah, no, I don't think it's gonna happen. So you're gonna be just fine. Mountain biking is dangerous and sometimes shit like that happens, but you'll be all right. I believe in you. Can you extend the travel of a DPX2 without buying a new one? Uh, yes and no. Um, there is sort of a way you can do it by modifying a spacer internally on the metric versions of the DPX2 shocks. I uh, highly recommend you don't do it. Fox would tell you you shouldn't do it. Um, but if you Google it and figure it out and do it yourself and mess up your shock, I'm not responsible. Or if it works, then I am responsible. How about that? What is going to happen in the future of the bike industry and mountain biking? I don't know. I am not a psychic, but I would say bikes will continue to get refined and iterated on and slightly more optimized. I think e-bikes are gonna get a lot bigger. I think, um, I don't know, probably more electronics are gonna happen and all types of things, not just e-bikes, but drivetrains, drop of posts, all that sort of stuff. Uh, I don't know, I just kinda like uh, wait and see what happens and be excited to try out when it comes. Air or coil, uh, we made an entire video on that, check that out. Uh, I personally like air on a trail and enduro bike because it's lighter and I think it works really well. Um, coil does feel awesome, but I'm personally kind of a weight weenie and I don't think the weight is worth the slight benefits in um, like improvement. Unless maybe a downhill bike. Yeah, okay. What the hell are you talking about? Benefits plus negatives of carbon wheels. Favorite wheel set? Well. Tough question. A long time ago, well, it wasn't that long ago, I made a video saying why I would never ride carbon wheels and I gave this big long explanation of how I think they're strong but sometimes they can break and they're slightly less reliable than aluminum and it pissed a whole bunch of people off and a whole bunch of people had armchair engineer comments on it. That's not very nice! A lot of people were related to it. Nonetheless, it was an interesting video. Go check it out. Um, there's been a lot of improvements in carbon wheels since then, and I'm not exactly sure if I could ever break a carbon wheel anymore. Um, when you're talking some of the newer ones, like the Zip 30 Motos and the Crank Brothers Synthesis, 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 Synthesis. What the hell are you talking about? Um, yeah, I don't know. I think uh, carbon wheels do have a really nice feeling to them. They used to be kind of too stiff. Now a lot of wheels are coming out that are more compliant, like the ones I just named in particular, and those feel awesome, kind of best of both worlds. I don't know, man. They're all good, it's hard to say. But what does still remain is carbon is damn expensive, so that's kind of why I also don't want to ride it. Uh, I love aluminum wheels, I see no problem with them. My favorite wheels have always been um, Industry 9, their system wheels. I was previously always riding their Enduro 305s. Um, Torch, now Hydra, and now I'm gonna try out a set of the Trail 270s Hydra. Um, aluminum rims, industry now, love those things. What do you get at the stand? I usually get the short rib grilled cheese sandwich. Mmm, that sounds pretty good. I usually get the ABC burger. For those of you that don't know, the stand uh, is a burger chain American Classics redefined uh, restaurant chain around sort of SoCal LA area. And uh, the guy who, one of the owners of the place, Jason, awesome dude, mountain biker. Uh, we love him and he's a customer and we hang out with him all the time and we always eat at the stand because it's friggin' delicious. Next question. One by 12 or one by 11, which do you prefer? Hmm. Well, I personally prefer one by 11. The reason is, is because it's lighter and I'm a weight weenie and because where I ride most and for how long I ride, I don't feel that for me, there's any necessity to have that big of a gear range that one by 12 comes with. Um, certain people, certain situations, one by 12, I would say probably for most situations, and most riders, one by 12 makes way more sense, but I still like one by 11 because I think it works just fine and it's lighter and there you go. What wrong with Santa Cruz? You never talk about Nomad or Bronson. Um, nothing's wrong with Santa Cruz. I think they're awesome. I think they make killer bikes. It's amazing brands. It's amazing how fast those guys grew in the last 15 years. Uh, yeah, we don't sell their bikes, but I've ridden a few of them and I've liked them. I definitely enjoy them. 
Uh, we actually did a review on a Hightower LT with one of our good friends and sponsored riders, Troyden. So yeah, that was a while ago. If you wanna check that out, go for it. Uh, we never really have much access to Santa Cruz bikes to ride and test them. So yeah, that's why. And we can only ever make so many videos. Um, no, I didn't. But the picture of me working at McDonald's that you can see here was made by one of the guys that works here, I think Raymond. Um, I don't know, I thought it was pretty funny. I never did. I actually never had a real job until Worldwide Cyclery, which I don't know if this is a real job either. But what I mean by that is I was never on an actual payroll and got a uh, W-2 like tax form until Worldwide Cyclery. Uh, I worked under the table at a bike shop and uh, then I worked under the table once as a tile slave kid and then I sold some stuff on eBay. I don't actually sell anything here, I just sell them on eBay. Oh, I don't get it. Yeah, that was it. Does a hamburger travel well inside a camelback? Yeah, totally. What's your most recent mountain bike related rant? Mm, probably something regarding weight of some stuff, um, or if it's more industry thing, it's probably some pricing thing. I'm always talking about like the business side of stuff that's going on in the bike industry in terms of advertised pricing and different shops and who sells what and all that sort of stuff. Um, I definitely go on rants a lot. And this question is from one of the guys who works at Worldwide Cycler. He probably just uh, being, a, being a meanie because he's making fun of me going on rants all the time. Last question. Hi, Jeff. Was on your website ordering stuff, as you do. And I must admit, your pricing is sharp, but then comes the freight charges to good old New Zealand. And I know that it's a long way from you guys, but 72 USD freight for a set of crank boots and a chain checker had to cancel my orders. Great video and your team uh, to do. Uh, yeah, I wish we could ship things to New Zealand for less money, but I don't set those prices. So I don't know what you want me to do, man. I'm sorry. Thank you guys for watching. If you're still at the end of this video, you're amazing. And we'll see you next time. Oh, hit the subscribe button. Come on.